right, so it's a little bit past eight o'clock. Um, we're just gonna start while people are filling in here. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in to this week of our uh, e-lecture series. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items before we begin. A reminder to everyone that all interactive features for attendees have been disabled to ensure optimal quality for all viewers. If you have any questions, you can see the email address there, emerymskradiology at gmail.com. Uh, the speaker today has graciously agreed to uh, allow for time to answer any questions you may have. Um, the talk is going to be excellent, so start thinking about those questions because uh, you are fortunate to have a world expert in this topic. Um, so this is your place to do the question asking. Um, and we will record this. Uh, he has also agreed to allow for recording, so we're going to record this um, conference and we will upload it uh, to the YouTube channel hopefully later today. Um, a reminder, the attendees have not been given permission to screen record this talk or any of the talks in the e-lecture series, and it may contain uh, material under copyright. Unauthorized recording, use, distribution, and sale of this material without permission from the speaker is illegal. Um, so with that, I want to introduce the uh, speaker today. Um, he is uh, well known in the MSK uh, world. Um, it's going to be Dr. Jan Fritz. Uh, he is a full-time MSK radiologist, associate professor, and the current division chief of MSK radiology at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine in New York City. His research and practice focus on the development and clinical integration of novel and rapid MSK MRI techniques, uh, metal artifact reduction MRI, MR neurography, interventional MR imaging, and machine learning techniques uh, are also well known. He's authored numerous peer-reviewed scientific uh, articles, review articles, book chapters, lectured in both the national and international meetings that we all attend. Um, he does CME talks, uh, local talks as well. Um, he serves on numerous editorial boards of journals um, or reviewing for journals. And the ones that he serves on the editorial board include skeletal radiology, investigative radiology, current radiology reports, and PLS-1. Uh, Finally, he's the MSK chair of the ISM-SM Educational Committee and the MSK table chair for the ISM-RM annual meeting in Vancouver in 2021, which will hopefully be an in-person meeting. Um, we really appreciate him coming to talk. Uh, you know, I, it's just a brief blurb, but um, you know, I've seen him talk on uh, metal MR before and uh, really is just a, a top uh, leader in, in this field. Um, and we're very fortunate to have him talking about that today. Jan, I'm gonna turn that over to you. Great, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning from uh, New York City. Uh, is my slide being seen? You are sharing, we see it. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you for having me. This um, is really a fantastic series with uh, uh, the who is who of uh, MSK, so I'm humbled to join. And uh, I have been very much enjoying and following this lecture uh, series and uh, uh, what a great uh, outcome from COVID that is. Okay, so here are my disclosures, some of which are relevant to the topic. However, uh, everything I speak about today is based on my clinical practice, previously at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore and uh, now in New York City as well. So over the next 45 minutes uh, or so, we're gonna uh, review uh, the clinical applications, challenges, and the outlook of arthroplasty imaging. Uh, we're gonna talk about some vendor terminology, which I think uh, is always a point of confusion. Uh, but also ever-evolving. And then uh, we're going to tackle some practical problem-solving uh, uh, issues about what happens when we introduce metal into MRI and how we uh, solve the problems with high bandwidth imaging. Uh, how do we solve a failed fat suppression? Then we can talk about uh, advanced metal artifact reduction techniques like CMAC and Maverick, uh, the use of VAT, um, uh, ETLs, like how long echo trains influence metal artifacts, then about how we can reduce uh, long acquisition times, which are associated with the advanced metal suppression techniques, and then hopefully review uh, the whole gamut of uh, clinical applications, which is really uh, all the arthroplasties, like hip arthroplasty, knee arthroplasty, ankle arthroplasty, shoulder arthroplasty, but also 
other orthopedic implants for osteosynthesis like plates, screws, rods, then tumor prostheses and then uh, how the technique can be applied to immunography as well. So um, this is a, a, a organization of the uh, a basically clinical applications. So there's the big group of orthoplasty implants and then there is the, the group of tumor prostheses, which is a separate group in this, in this chart because uh, usually these orthoplasty uh, uh, implants are bigger because they're being used for limb reconstruction. Then immunography, uh, which requires a little bit of modification and then osteosynthesis, which has specific indications, although we use uh, usually x-rays and, uh, X -ray and uh, CT imaging. So you may have uh, seen or experienced the same as we have in our practice that there is a, seems to be an ever increasing number in uh, patients with uh, implants. And that is because, uh, especially knee and hip orthoplasty is one of the most successful surgeries of mankind. So not only in orthopedic surgery, <clears throat> but uh, of all surgeries, it's in the top three. So um, it's being said that more than 90% of patients are happy with the result uh, and, um, the volumes have been going up. So in the US in 2020, there were about 1.5 million uh, hip orthoplasty implantations. And uh, it's predicted that in 2030, for knee orthoplasty, there's gonna be 3.5 million procedures in the year. So there's a, a lot more knee orthoplasty in general done than hip orthoplasty. But if you add the revisions, uh, there's gonna be a lot of patients uh, with uh, orthoplasty implants. Now ankles are being done as well and shoulders are being done more commonly as well. Uh, some even uh, do elbows. So there's going to be an increasing number of patients that have uh, implants, uh, orthoplasty implants, but also orthopedic implants, uh, for which the surgeons uh, often would like to have a preoperative diagnosis, or we monitor certain diseases like adverse local tissue reactions uh, to metal products. So what's there to improve, right? So um, this is a patient that slipped on the scanner, and sometimes you ask patients, you know, do you have a uh, uh, joint replacements, or do you have hip orthoplasty, and patients say no, and then they get on the scanner, and boom, there it is. And so usually there's a barrier in communication. But these are good cases to learn what happens when we apply our normal um, MRI protocols and how it comes out and how we, do, how we do not want it to look like. But this is a good case because it exemplifies what happens uh, if we do that. And so there's the image distortion, distortion which we can see here. Um, which is related to the signal displacement, then there's the signal pileup. So there's these areas where the signal is way too bright. So there's way too much MR signal, right? And so there's some sort of uh, movement around from signal uh, from areas where there should be uh, not enough signal or where there is not enough signal to areas where there is now way too much signal. And then of course, there's the failed fat suppression. So this is all done with spectral fat suppression. And for example, here on this axial image, you have a hard time to see that it was actually done with fat suppression, right? And so these are the different things that we would like to uh, uh, address. Now, vendor terminology. So uh, meanwhile, and I, we just picked here the three uh, main vendors, but there's four, five, six vendors. Meanwhile, they all have their uh, metal suppression techniques, which is great. So it's really uh, available on most platforms. Uh, but especially when it comes to uh, trade names and what is actually in the packages, it gets uh, complicated. However, it's fair to say that uh, most of the vendors today have advanced and basic metal suppression. So basic metal suppression is usually considered a high receiver bandwidth uh, turbo spin echo or fast spin echo techniques like here, these in the first plane. And this is the basic technique that's basically involved, included in all the advanced techniques as well. So it's like a, a, a layered system. Uh, some systems then add VAT, which we're gonna talk about, and then the advanced metal suppression techniques, which is a Maverick and a CMAX. So there's Maverick SL, there's OMAR and OMAR XD, and then there's warp and advanced warp, which is not even on this uh, table. But usually when it says advanced or something, uh, uh, higher, higher edition, that means that uh, the vendors added the advanced metal suppression, which is uh, CMAX. Uh, and even nowadays, Maverick SL uh, contains a, a large amount of CMAX. Uh, so CMEG is really uh, a very powerful and uh, most advanced metal suppression techniques use VAT in combination. So VAT is a very strong partner for these advanced metal suppressions. If you don't have the advanced metal suppression, uh, then high bandwidth is a, is a very good start uh, and a base platform to go with. And we'll, we'll talk about what this means, high bandwidth. 
Okay, so let's go uh, about how to practically problem solve these metal artifacts, right? Um, so uh, amongst the physicists of you, uh, I do know that there is a lot more than breaking it down into three problems, but uh, I'm taking a, a clinical perspective on this today. And so we just have a, a, this as a table to show um, how many problems there are to solve. But if we break this down, uh, we can, for practical purposes, break it down into signal defacing, failed fat suppression, and then the problems of signal displacement and distortion, which is, which is a big group and maybe the, the hardest to tackle. So signal defacing, we were able to do this uh, to address this very early on. And uh, signal defacing can be shown if you compare a gradient echo pulse sequence with a turbo spin echo pulse sequence. And so the main difference of these two pulse sequences is that you, re you recall your echoes uh, with gradient echo pulse sequences with uh, gradient inversion, whereas with pulse, uh, with turbo spin echo pulse sequences, you use uh, 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 pulse, uh, radio frequency pulses to do that. And so if we, we use gradient echo pulse sequences, we uh, exaggerate with every uh, recall the artifact, which you can see here. This is an axial image of a hip arthroplasty uh, patient. And so the uh, artifact is huge because this is a gradient echo pulse sequence, whereas if you use a turbo spin echo pulse sequence, uh, the artifact is much smaller, right? And so uh, signal defacing we can, we can address with turbo spin echo pulse sequences, and that's really the mainstay. Uh, there's only one exception I use in my practice for gradient echo pulse sequences, and that's dynamic contrast enhancement. I think I have a case in here if the linear runs, uh, but otherwise, fast and turbo spin echo pulse sequences uh, is the way to go. And so this addresses uh, already a big chunk of artifact there. Now, uh, failed fat suppression. So that is a big problem, right? So uh, when you rem if you remember from physics that depending on how strong your field uh, is, that the of protons that are bound to water or the protons that are bound to fat, uh, they precess, so they spin with a different frequency. And we can, uh, this separation we can exploit for spectral fat suppression, right? So before we start imaging, we can send a pulse and can suppress uh, uh, fat bound protons. And that works well uh, uh, without metal. But once we introduce metal into the field of view, uh, uh, that goes out the window. So that peak is no longer where we think it is, and it's kind of all over. It can even be beyond the water peak. So there's no uh, spectral fat suppression uh, in, the, in the presence of metal. And I think uh, even with AI and advanced technique, this, I have not seen this working well yet, although it would be highly beneficial if we could make this work. Uh, and so this is what happens. This is from the case that we saw earlier that the spectral fat suppression will just fail. Now there's other techniques uh, like Dixon that sometimes work if you have a low, uh, small amount of failed fat set but usually not for arthroplasty. But if you have like small screws, like with an ACL knee or so, uh, Dixon can make a, 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 a meaningful difference, right? So for example, here uh, is a patient had ACL reconstruction, has an interference screw here in the femur. And so this one uh, made a small failed fat suppression here, uh, this halo-like uh, fat suppression, the spectral fat suppression. And this case goes to show that STIR is, is the, the, the most solid of fat suppression that we can apply um, in the presence of metal. Now, in this case, you probably would have gotten away with Dixon. Actually, I think clinically this would not have made a difference, but it's a nice case to show the difference here, okay? So uh, stir fat suppression is only dependent on T1 or mainly dependent on T1, which is not influenced by metal, so this is great. Whereas the spectral fat suppression is influenced by the precession frequency and the separation of the spins, which is influenced by metal. So why is this important? Right, so sometimes we think, okay, we missed it. We used spectral fat suppression. We should have used stir, but we kind of anticipate that, and it's not a problem, right? So this is a case in point where uh, we used spectral fat suppression, but we should have used stir. Patient got on the table, had a um, has a, a partially visualized femur rod for fracture, and had a knee pain. And uh, we looked at this case, and so the question, maybe in your practice as well, okay, do we call this patient back for stir images? or do you anticipate the failed fat set? It's supposed to be a failing here with a halo and uh, uh, you know anticipate that and let it go. So this one, we did not let go, we called back. So we called the patient back a week later with stir and then we saw here the aggressive osteomyelitis, right? So this, goes, uh, this, this uh, case taught us and we used it internally as well, uh, how important it is that we use the uh, proper fat suppression in these cases to actually make the diagnosis because although uh, we anticipate the failed fat suppression, it can really ma mask uh, abnormalities like in this case, 
uh, with a uh, um, already um, prolific uh, osteoma uh, periostitis here in the bone marrow edema and the T1 weighted image is showed there as well. Okay, so we said STIR really works best with uh, uh, metal implants, especially arthroplasty implants. However, even if we use STIR, sometimes it fails. And so here is a metal on metal right hip arthroplasty and we still have this halo of failed fat suppression. So when this happened the first time, we scratched our hands and we said, you know, I thought we understood the physics and we said this only depends on T1, so why is it still failing? And the problem why it's failing is because the bandwidth of the inversion pulse is not matched with the readout bandwidth. So we said we, we're going to use high readout bandwidth, which is usually in five to 600 hertz per pixel. And um, if your inversion pulses don't match, uh, this is what happens. So you can't reach all the, uh, uh, all the protons, right? And so here is another case here of a coronal image of a unicomponental a knee orthoplasty, and you have these, these, these clouds of failed fat suppression despite using stir and high bandwidth, right? And the way uh, to go about this is uh, to match the inversion pulse uh, bandwidth with a readout bandwidth. And if we do that, uh, then uh, the fat suppression gets homogeneous, what we expect, and then we can see that there is actually some bone marrow edema along the tibial component, which could be a stress riser here, or could be the, the pain generator in this patient, but it was masked before uh, due to the failed fat suppression. So uh, if we do stir imaging, it is important to match the bandwidth between the uh, excitation or the refocusing pulses and the uh, readout bandwidth. Okay, so RF optimized uh, stir is, is the way to go. And then signal displacement and distortion. So this is the uh, most difficult uh, problem to address, but uh, with recent developments, I think we're pretty close to have this uh, ideally or 100% address. So remember that signal displacement uh, always happens in the frequency encoding directions. And in two-dimensional imaging, we have two of those, right? So we always remember the in-plane direction. One is frequency, one is phase. So it doesn't happen in phase encoding direction, but it happens in frequency uh, uh, direction. And then we have uh, slice encoding, which is also frequency-based. So it happens in two different uh, directions, right? And so this is where high bandwidth imaging uh, comes in. So the in-plane frequency displacement we can address with high bandwidth imaging, right? And so this is my uh, attempt to, graphic, to graphically show why this works and how it works, right? So um, the yellow line is a low receiver bandwidth and the red line is a high receiver bandwidth. And while the signal displacement on a frequency basis does not change, right? So when you have metal in the magnetic field, the local magnetic field changes. And if you remember the Lamar's frequency, the precession frequencies are proportional um, to the local magnetic field. So you can imagine if you introduce metal in your local magnetic field, then it changes. And then the precession frequencies changes and the scanner can no longer uh, allocate the, the spins correctly, the signal that comes from the spins. So signal displacement occurs. However, um, it depends uh, basically how, so it's being translated in a frequency shift and the frequency shift determines how many pixels you uh, displace. So <clears throat> you encode your image with uh, a range of bandwidth, right? So every pixel has a range of bandwidth where a signal falls into uh, that you receive. So if you use a high receiver bandwidth, you will have a lot more frequencies packed into, into uh, each pixel. So if you have a, a certain signal displacement on a frequency domain, if you use a lot more uh, uh, frequencies per pixel, your overall signal displacement is less with high bandwidth, right? And so this is supposed to be shown here. So your signal displacement here is always the same, but the way it translates into your image and your pixel displacement depends on the steepness of your uh, frequency, the bandwidth encoding, right? So high bandwidth here at the red line is still uh, experiencing, experiencing the same signal displacement, but the actual image displacement is much less, right? Because you're using more frequencies to encode a pixel. Okay, so um, if this is too complicated, it really uh, is, is, is not so important for practice, but if you remember, you have to crank up your readout bandwidth uh, for metal suppression, that is probably all you need to know. And here's an example. You have here 200 hertz per pixel and uh, frequent, uh, frequency encoding here, and here you have 700 hertz per pixel, so this is pretty good uh, with modern scanners. You can see how this metal uh, artifact here of our axial uh, left hip replacement is already reduced with a, uh, with a high bandwidth. Now it's not completely reduced because we said it also happens in the through plane uh, displacement. And so uh, there is still something to be done. 
But a high readout bandwidth is basically the basis. And this is what, what is meant when everybody says uh, high bandwidth imaging, high, high bandwidth FSE, high bandwidth TSE. It really means that the readout bandwidth is, is uh, increased. And I would say at 1.5, something between 5 and 600 hertz per pixel. Some vendors use different uh, 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 units, so you have to um, uh, convert it. But this is probably a good way to go. I would say at three Tesla, it should be more like six, seven, eight hundred hertz per pixel. So you need good gradients to be able to do that. So where does this get us, right? So this is kind of the evolution of metal suppression. So uh, this image is just conventional FSE, TSE. So we have a lot of distortions and we have signal pileup, what we saw before. But when we uh, apply the optimized high bandwidth surface binacro, we can see that we get uh, a lot of improvement already. So we have less metal artifacts with less distortions, less signal displacement. Also, now we're imaging with high bandwidth. So uh, another fact is that our images get much sharp, much uh, uh, better looking. They get sharper and our image contrast gets better, right? But we're not there yet. And we said we're not there yet because the through plane displacement in frequency encoding has not been addressed yet, right? And that is actually sometimes difficult to see. So sometimes you get those high bandwidth images and it all looks pretty good. So this is a distal femur replacing tumor arthroplasty. Here's the patella. Here's a little bit of fluid around the implant. Here's the extensor mechanism. <clears throat> so this looks all pretty good. If you flip this into the coronal life performance technique just with thick slices, you can actually see how bad the through plane displacement is, right? So this should be straight. This is a coronal image now. And so um, this is how bad the distortions are here. And they go in, e in either direction, right? Almost looks like a, like a, a shepherd's crook here. Okay, and so to, in, in order to address that, uh, you need advanced metal suppression. Now, you can increase the uh, readout bandwidth or the, the, the bandwidth of the slice encoding with thinner slices, but usually we don't go less than three millimeters because the signal uh, drop is too high. Uh, as opposed to the in-plane uh, receiver bandwidth, we cannot freely dial in in our scanners how much, uh, how steep the slice encoding uh, gradient usually is. So that is not accessible to the user. So we need something else, right? And so one way to do that is CMAC and Maverick. So this is how CMAC works, right? And so CMAC is, is basically an algorithm that collects uh, the signal that is dis displaced in slice direction. And you as the user can uh, uh, define how many, uh, how many steps you want to use and how much of that metal uh, collection uh, steps you want to add. So this is basically the center image here with uh, the large artifact of the knee arthroplasty. And then we said it's gonna be displaced through the plane, right? So this is into negative direction and this is into the positive direction, like you would scroll through the knee. And you can see that outside these planes, there's still signal uh, that needs to be collected. And that algorithm connect, collects that signal and then paints it, pastes it here into those signal voids. And it's doing this from both sides. And depending on how many of those steps you utilize, you get later a composite image here and then uh, you have uh, uh, almost uh, uh, like, it's a, it's a function of how many encoding steps you use, but the more steps you use, the less metal artifact you have uh, uh, pressed in. Maverick works similarly. However, it doesn't work on, on face encoding, it works on frequency encoding uh, steps as well. But it similarly collects signal that is displaced out of the, out of the slice. So uh, this is a case that shows what this is actually doing. So this is high bandwidth imaging and the images Oh, uh, it look, doesn't, don't, don't look bad. So this is a unicompartmental knee arthroplasty here, right? Uh, the overall metal artifact is not bad, but uh, here is to show what we don't see, right? So if we apply the CMEC uh, uh, through plane correction, then we can see that these little pegs here that anchor uh, that plateau here in the tibia or that tibial component were actually obscured. They were somewhere displaced out of the plane and we didn't see that and uh, the other tibia plateau here in the axial image, we could also not see, but now it's brought back into the, into the slice. So there, um, sometimes it's hardest to see what we don't see, but sometimes real structures are being omitted and also abnormal findings like in this case. Okay, so applying these metal suppressions, these advanced metal suppressions, what they do is they, they reduce the through plane displacement or the signal displacement in slice encoding direction. So this is the other dimension that we're otherwise missing if we're just using high readout bandwidth. And if we look at, look at our evolution, right? So we went from conventional turbospinacro to optimized high, high bandwidth uh, turbospinacro and then applying CMAC algorithms on top of it, which in reality also uses VAT, which we'll talk about in a second. And you can see all of a sudden here, you can actually see the joint space here, the pseudo capsule, the fluid in between here, and then the tibial 
uh, component here, uh, um, uh, part of the tibial tray. We can also see uh, here the bone implant interface to better advantage. Okay, so what about view ankle tilting? You may have heard about that. It has been, uh, some vendors have been pushing this in the past, especially before uh, the advanced metal suppression hasn't been available uh, to all vendors. And basically what it does is it's trying to improve um, the signal displacement by artificially changing the, the, the view angle. And it's really uh, practically coming down to the view angle that we look at those images, right? We're usually used to look uh, at images perpendicularly. Uh, however, here as, as indicated by those, by those uh, uh, red arrows, however, if you would artific artificially change the view angle of the radiologist here, then what's overlapping here with a different view angle may be actually projected into a less overlap. And that is uh, applying to the signal displacement as well. So the signal displacements technically are not supposed to look as bad anymore if they change the, uh, if you change the view angle based on a, on a gradient technique. And so we tested that. And uh, I have to say in clinical practice, view angle tilting has never really worked for us. And we, have, we weren't really sure why it didn't work in isolation. I said, in, the, in combination with advanced metal suppression, this is really good. And I think CMAC needs uh, VAT. However, VAT in isolation may not bring uh, the greatest results or the results, results that you expect. And uh, we, we try to find out why that is. So we applied um, a view angle tilting to a hip arthroplasty here, coronal image at 150 hertz per pixel. Now we already learned that this is not how we're supposed to image those. We're supposed to image with a much higher bandwidth. But I think this is how uh, view angle tilting uh, was, in, uh, was developed. It wasn't developed with high readout bandwidth. It was developed with regular readout bandwidth. And we can see if we apply VAT at low readout bandwidth, there is actually an improvement of the metal artifact, right? So here's the, uh, the hip arthroplasty with the head and the acetabular component with large metal artifacts, and they are being reduced with VAT. However, the reason why it didn't work for us is probably because we always image at a high readout bandwidth, like 600 hertz per pixel, and then you apply VAT here, and there's actually very little difference. Uh, you could almost say it's actually maybe a little bit worse, or it's just the shape looks different, uh, but the effect is really not there, right? So we were all like, oh wow, this, this didn't do anything. It probably doesn't do anything because with a high readout bandwidth, the effect of VAT is small, right? So that's something to keep in mind, and we have tried it here with the hip arthroplasty as well. You can see at 600 hertz per pixel, the effect of VAT only, this is not with CMAX, this is just VAT, is actually small, right? And you can see with this hip arthroplasty, uh, you almost don't, do not even need CMAX. This is actually pretty good already with uh, high readout bandwidth. Okay, so echo train length. So let's talk quickly about echo train length. So um, there, there is the opinion out there that increasing your echo train length so the number of refocusing echoes that you use in a fast interpospin echo will reduce your metal artifact. And I have seen anecdotal uh, examples uh, from one vendor where this apparently takes place. Okay, so it hasn't made sense to us why that would be the case. Why would uh, longer echo trains actually reduce your metal artifacts? If anything, it should get a little bit of, maybe a little bit worse, but it should actually stay the same. There's also some ACR guidelines uh, that, that, that cite some of the papers or state that uh, increasing echo train length will reduce your metal artifacts. So we did an experiment and we said, let's isolate that. Let's isolate, uh, let's, let's create a pulse sequence where you can increase the echo train length and you can increase the bandwidth uh, independently. And I think that's the key to explain that. So here, these uh, rows uh, are, are all the same bandwidth and uh, the columns are all the same uh, echo train length. And you can see regardless of which <clears throat> of which row you use, that the metal artifact always stays the same. It's not affected by the echo train length, right? And that's what you would expect. Uh, it, I haven't found a physical explanation why longer echo trains would reduce the metal artifact. But what you can see, of course, is that with increasing bandwidth, your metal artifact goes down. And that's to be expected here in this uh, ankle arthroplasty. And then, of course, if you apply advanced metal suppression, you almost have no metal artifact there. But what you can see is, and what we know clinically, if you use very long echo trains, you get blurring, right? And so this is what's happening. So if anything, uh, the, the long echo trains in our study made the image quality worse and the overall uh, metal artifact appearance a little bit worse because you introduce blurring. Um, however, I think why this may work at some systems is that there may be a connection in the background between echo train length and bandwidth. So maybe in some systems, they will uh, increase the bandwidth. If you, if you use longer echo trains. And so maybe this will be an indirect effect. Uh, 
but I think uh, it, it may not be correct to say that increasing ecotrain length will reduce metal artifacts. Okay. So then the next question is, okay, so we have to advance metal artifact reduction techniques. And uh, if you have used them clinically, you, you may have experienced right away that they take time. And they take time because you have to use those uh, extra steps where you collect all the signal from, from out of plane displacement, right? And um, here is one of our protocols uh, to show with uh, Tuber Spin Echo CMAC how to make your uh, uh, pulse sequences faster. So one thing you can do is you can re reduce the TRs, right? So we usually say in MSK, we want to image above 4,000 millisecond TRs for PD and STIRs and, and uh, uh, T2, uh, T2-weighted imaging. But I think for osteoplasty implants, uh, especially if you, you, if you use CMAC, you have such an abundance of signal, you probably can uh, reduce your, uh, uh, your TRs down. So this will take, save directly time. The number of CMAC steps. So not all implants need like 17 or 19 or a high degree of metal suppression. So you can tune your CMAX steps to the implants. Unfortunately, sometimes that is a little bit of a experience thing or we have to try or see the first images to see if we need more or less CMAX steps, but that will be directly proportional uh, to time. And then uh, using turbo uh, uh, echo train for acceleration for turbo factors is also helpful. So I think these techniques uh, easily tolerate a turbo factor of 10, and then you can see the imaging times come down. They're still high, but they are somewhere between uh, seven, around seven minutes, which, uh, which is okay in clinical practice. Um, I'm not saying use the entire protocol here, but this is just a library of, of CMAX sequences that can be used here, uh, for example, for the knee. Um, however, there's the new kit on the block that's uh, compressed sensing or sparsity driven CMAX. So that means we have learned over time that CMAC acquires such a huge amount of data, and especially the uh, off-center images uh, have a high degree of redundancy. That means there's a lot of data in there that we actually don't use for image reconstruction. And that means that if we would sample less, uh, we would actually get away with a, small, with a lower sample size, a sample time, but we would still be able to reconstruct the images to the same degree. And this is what compress sensing means. Compress sensing means that you center, for example, here, the center of case space. This is how this sequence does it. But then in the periphery, we know that we don't need all this information. If we do this in a smart way, we can reconstruct uh, the information around of each of these dots uh, mathematically, but we don't need to sample it, right? So the image you would get is something like this, so very blurry. However, if you apply your compress sensing and iterative reconstruction, you actually get 99.9% uh, .9 to the image that you would uh, get if you uh, sample fully. And what you gained is you reduced your uh, acquisition time. You just need computer power to reconstruct these images, which like always in, me in medicine uh, lags a little bit behind, but I think we have made big progress there. So here's one of the studies that we did where we compared the conventional CMAC versus the compress sensing CMAC. And surprisingly, this gets very close. We didn't see much of a difference. And what you get clinically here is uh, high bandwidth images maybe take between four and five minutes. And with the compress sensing acceleration, you can apply CMAC here. Uh, what used to be here uh, with, with high CMAX steps, I think 19 uh, collapses then down to four to five minutes as well. So this is available clinically now as well. It's FDA approved and uh, we use it on our 3T scanners uh, avidly. Here is a hip resurfacing arthroplasty, same thing. So with compress sensing, you get up to 70% uh, time reduction here, which really brings these sequences down nicely to uh, clinically useful acquisition times, right? So uh, here's the comparison. So you can do parallel imaging acceleration or compress sensing acceleration of these fault sequences. Here's the number of CMAX steps. So 19 is afforded uh, by the compress sensing and you still, uh, uh, the acceleration factor comes up to eight then, and then you get these uh, fault sequences which are in the four to five minute range with, these, with this high degree of metal suppression. And it works for the knee here as well. Similarly, you can use 19 CMAX encoding steps uh, this is considered uh, a high metal suppression with an acceleration factor of eight versus three in parallel imaging, and then your time collapses down to four to five minutes. So that's clinically useful and available. Uh, and I think this is a great uh, uh, advancement in metal suppression. And so the question is always, are they really the same? So we did a clinical study here comparing cases, not just volunteers. So this is a patient with metallosis. You can see here, this small collections here. The great deuterium verse on some are actually dark because they're filled with uh, metal debris and some are bright that are filled with fluid. And you can see here, this is the parallel imaging CMAC 
and the convergence in CMAX accelerated uh, versions, and they look uh, rather similar. Similarly, here in the knee, uh, one is the comfort sensing version and one is the parallel imaging version. So what about 3T, right? So uh, a lot of us in our practices, we have 3T scanners, which is really well for MSK and neuro and even some of the body applications. So we would like to use that at 3T. And uh, depends a little bit on the implant. However, uh, these examples goes to show that for the vast majority of implants, 3T is possible as well especially if you use compressed sensing CMAC, you need to use more metal suppression. So the imaging uh, time is a little bit longer, but it is feasible at, at 3T here at these PD weighted uh, coronal images of, a, of a, a knee arthroplasty here. Here's a knee uh, arthroplasty showing here some osteolysis around uh, the tibial bone implant interface at 1.5 and 3T as well. Uh, here's an ankle arthroplasty implant here as well. Images got a little bit degraded by a PowerPoint here. I just see uh, but for the metal suppression here, you can see the metal artifact is almost the same. And you see these small subchronal cysts here uh, to similar advantage. Uh, also the, the native compartments here as well. Um, so we're using this at our 3T scanners and uh, follow us on Twitter. Okay, so we post uh, very interesting clinical cases there and try to keep up with what we do clinically. And for example, here at 3T, that allows you to see the bone implant interface here well where you can see here that there's on, uh, incomplete osseous integration with a bone marrow edema pattern, which could be the reason why the patient is unable to bear weight. And also for hip arthroplasty, you see the bone implant interfaces uh, uh, very well there. Okay, so let's review some of the clinical applications uh, and switch gears and see how we can actually use this clinically and what it can show. Okay, so here's one of the, of the protocols uh, that, that we have devised previously and used clinically. So this is the high bandwidth protocol for 1.5 scanner. If you want to uh, plug those numbers in, uh, I'll just leave it for your review. And this is the CMAC version. That's, the, uh, that's not the compressed sensing CMAC version, but the parallel imaging CMAC version that I showed before. Uh, and here are just some examples on how you would use uh, contrast enhancement, right? So contrast enhancement is not always used. Uh, it's also not always necessary. But if you use it, uh, the way to do it, since we can't use spectral fat suppression, is subtraction, right? So we acquire a T1-weighted image before and after contrast injection. So here you can see the bladder is bright, so there has been contrast injected here. And now you can subtract, and then you get an image that looks similar to a T1 fat set image with, with the contrast enhancement. And here you can see this is just a simple collection of the trade account here, Berta, uh, no problem there. Uh, this can also be done with CMEX. So CMEX is basically a full, a full TSE integration. It's just a button, you turn it on, and then uh, you use these additional CMEX steps. And here you can use pre and post contrast images with subtraction here. It's a patient with tumor arthroplasty reconstruction as well. Okay, so here are some interesting facts in the literature. So MRI is actually the most accurate modality for a whole variety of abnormalities around implants. For example, paired prosthetic osteolysis, interestingly, MRI has uh, almost consistently found to be more accurate than CT and um, radiography, also for the detection of occult fractures pair prosthetic collection, polyethylene wear induced synovitis. Uh, also, meanwhile, probably infection is, is, uh, is being added there. Adverse local tissue reactions, which is what used to be called pseudotumors, so that's the preferred term now. Uh, pair prosthetic masses and then integrity of the pseudocapsule muscles, tendons, and neurovascular bundle. So here's a checklist that we published before in, ra in radiographics. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go through that, but this is what, uh, what I use clinically, and I think it's a nice guide uh, of course, can be modified and, and expanded or uh, contracted, but this is a, a guide to think uh, basically from the implant going outside in an envelope fashion to dictate these, these cases. So here are some interesting cases. So periprosthetic osteolysis. This is also a case that uh, it is worth spending the time for the advanced metal suppression. So here's high bandwidth TSE. I would say this is a pretty good artifact here, right? Uh, there is some expected distortion around uh, the uh, acetabular component. However, what you may would have missed is that there is actually osteolysis here around the implant, right? So the bone implant interface should not have a sclerotic line interposed or any hyperintense signal like here. So this cup is almost completely loose. So you can see it's almost circumferential loss of, of osseous fixation here. And so uh, this is better seen, especially around the bone implant interfaces with the advanced metal suppression here. So here's a case around the stem, right? So here is osteolysis here along the proximal and uh, mid green zones here uh, with interposed signal hyperintensity or fluid. And on the axials, you can see there's almost a circumferential 
uh, osteolysis. However, distally, it's still integrated, right? So this implant is probably not loose, but it may be well on the way there uh, uh, to show that. Uh, periprosthetic fractures, of course, they, uh, they are seen on radiographs and CT, but some of them are not, or sometimes they're not suspected, and we get them on MRI, like here, this small crack here along the lateral cortex. We see bone marrow edema, which indicates probably micromotion of the stem here, right? And uh, when we look at the axial images, sometimes these are cold because the x-ray beams uh, uh, are perpendicular uh, to, the, uh, to the fracture margins here, right? Um, especially these small uh, femoral stem cracks. I've seen several cases where MRI picks them up where radi radiography didn't show them. Now polyethylene where induced synovitis, that's the, the classic particles disease, right? So this is macrophage mediated, it causes osteolysis. And typically what it does is it causes these conglomerates of polyethylene and on the PD weighted images, they look like muscles, right? They look like muscles in signal intensity and also often in structure and they have these uh, filled osteolysis here where <clears throat> the polyethylene debris just um, migrates into the, into the bone and causing these particulate osteolysis, right? So this is prototypical polyethylene wear induced synovitis. Um, here's a case of metallosis. So metallosis means you have usually somewhere a metal on metal surface and it, it wears and it, it shreds small metal, metal particles. So this is actually also on the spectrum of particles disease. It also activates macrophages. And the reason why we can say, say this is uh, metallosis because we see this black lining here of the uh, greater planetary bursa. Now we don't have blooming because we're applying CMAG metal suppression, right? Uh, but we see the black lining, which is a prototypical for a uh, metallosis. Remember this other case where we had these small uh, vacuoles that were filled with metal debris who also uh, did not exhibit fluid signal. Now this is a, a adverse local tissue reaction, which is uh, thought to be a hypersensitivity reaction. So this is really immune mediated, like a type four. It's not macrophage mediated. And here is a very aggressive one. So this is one of the metal on metal arthroplasties, which are less and less available because they're being replaced or revised. But you can see here, there's a very thick rinded synovitis here, very aggressive already ate through the abductors here and here in the uh, iliosoas bursa or subiliacus bursa as well, right? So this looks different than, than the particle disease that we just saw. Uh, here's a case that compares CT to MRI. Uh, of course, CT has metal suppression. In, in bone windows, it looks great, but often what we're interested in is the soft tissue window. And then when you go back in soft tissue window, you have a lot of artifacts. Admittedly, this is an extreme case, but uh, the corresponding OR image shows that there is an adverse local tissue reaction with this thick rinded uh, synovitis here that may be obscured in CT or not well seen, right? And um, here's an interesting case from last week that we also posted uh, on Twitter, right? So there is this, uh, generation of rejuvenate stems from one special vendor that uh, was known to, to uh, cause uh, substantial adverse local tissue reactions, and some of them are still in and doing well. So this is a great uh, rejuvenate stem, healthy, working well, no problem here, right? But uh, this is what, what metal suppression is used for, so these get annual monitoring just to, to make sure that there's no adverse local tissue reaction. Uh, being incited. Now, adverse local tissue reactions, which is the term that is preferred now over pseudotumor. Pseudotumor also has some legal implications, so it's better to say adverse local tissue reaction comes at a spectrum, and this is from our radi radiographics article uh, that, I, that I wrote with uh, uh, Dr. Potter uh, when, I was my, when I did my fellowship at HSS. Um, so here you can see that uh, these, these go from mostly fluid with a thick uh, rinded synovitis to a uh, more particulate synovitis, to thicker rind, uh, to almost solid deposits, right? And histologically, uh, this is correlated with, with the aggressiveness and the degree of the adverse local tissue reaction. Now, histologically, this is alval, right? Which is such a nice word and everybody uses it, but technically uh, on imaging, we can't use alval because we don't know, right? Because it's a histological diagnosis. But this is uh, what uh, also Dr. Potter found out. So MRI is really, uh, excellent to diagnose adverse local tissue reactions, and even this correlation between uh, uh, imaging findings and, and aggressiveness uh, works really well with MRI. Uh, how about infection? So MRI is, is helpful for infection uh, in about 70 to 80 percent accuracy. Uh, so here's a, a case that has a bulging synovitis, packed lymph nodes here inguinally, and this is the axial cut of the sinus tract that was uh, 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 migrating anteriorly along the femoral stem. So you have the classic signs of infection here. Here is a more uh, impressive case of an infection. So lots of periprosthetic collection, also sinus tract here, 
right, which, which by definition is the uh, infection here. Um, the concern was actually tumor recurrence in this case. So we gave contrast and you can see this avidly enhancing synovitis here uh, posteriorly. Um, recent paper from, uh, from our colleagues at Belgris and University of Zurich uh, found uh, that MRI is about 80% accurate with findings uh, similar to uh, native joints, like if you have a edematous synovitis with surrounding edema pattern, just aggressive uh, features, this is uh, suggestive of a uh, periprosthetic joint infection, like in this case. So edematous synovitis already ruptured here through the abductors and it's probably about to form a sinus tract. Now the ones we miss are the ones that are, that are less virulent. So this was also infected at only a little bit of joint fluid here in the pseudocapsule, a little bit of edema, which sometimes persists after reaming for a long time. And I think with those, we have a hard time. There's no lymph nodes either here. Uh, other advantages of MRI, we can uh, evaluate the abductors. So here's a hip resurfacing arthroplasty where there's a, a defect through the abductors here. And on the coronal and sagittal images, we can show uh, the size of these defects and sometimes they can be uh, fixed arthroscopically. Okay, so let's switch gears and go to the knee. So here's a, a, a knee arthroplasty high bandwidth protocol that you could use clinically and here's the CMAC protocol. So in the interest of time, I would just uh, move along. Similarly to the hip, uh, we have published a checklist how you could dictate those knee orthoplasties. This is what I use clinically. And I think this also goes from the implant in an envelope fashion outside uh, 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 to the more peripheral tissues. And so bone implant interface assessment is uh, uh, surprisingly good with MRI and maybe better than initially thought. So here is, is a case where there is solid osseous integration with inner digitation. And then there's an area where there's fibrous membrane formation a small area of sclerosis with interposed signal, right? So here the interdigitation did not happen. And interestingly, there's a bone marrow edema around it. So maybe there's like a, a local stress reaction there. Uh, this is the case that I showed earlier. So here are these areas of incomplete osseous integration where there's a, a, a sclerotic rim being built and where there's fluid interposed, right? Um, we can also see osteolysis. So here uh, is a small osteolysis along the femoral flange here. Uh, probably not a problem in this case, but sometimes this is being monitored to see if it progresses or, is, or it stays the same. Uh, osteolysis can be huge, like in this case. So here there's a, a near circumferential bone resorption along the implant here, but there's these big osteolysis, uh, which we thought were, were okay, but the surgeons were very concerned and said we need to make sure this is not uh, some, something neoplastic, right? And in this case, you can give uh, contrast to the subtractions and show that these are uh, non-solid or at least particular uh, due to the synovitis. So a lot of bone loss in this patient uh, secondary to uh, particles disease. Uh, here's the axial images of these large osteolysis with, with pre and post contrast for which we could do subtraction and show that they are not endoplastic. Sometimes non-displaced fractures we can see here, for example here, a fracture non-displaced along the retropatellar button here with some bone marrow edema, uh, also better seen on the, metal, on the advanced metal suppression. Uh, bone implant interface osteolysis is something, is something interesting if you compare to um, radiographs like here. So sometimes we have these areas of decreased uh, bone density here and we wonder if this is an osteolysis. There's a little bit incomplete film filled with notching posteriorly. So we did metal suppression and we found that this is actually okay, but the, uh, the uh, bone implant interface osteolysis filled with this particular synovitis here is actually here posteriorly. Uh, which, which was interesting and uh, possibly why the patient couldn't bear weight anymore on this implant. Uh, quadriceps tendon uh, uh, assessment is also well done with MRI here. The quadriceps tendon and the patella tendon look a little bit tendinotic here, not torn yet, uh, but probably um, not the best tendon quality anymore. Uh, here's an interesting case with recurrent hemarthrosis. So some, some patients have well-functioning arthroplasty implants, but they get these recurrent hemorrhagic joint effusions and some of these cases are because they, uh, uh, the, the synovium gets caught between the arthroplasty implants. And then over time, they develop these fossa where they have like a quote unquote brittle syno syno synovium. And then you can do co dynamic contrast enhancement. You can see where these hotspots are and then they can be selectively embolized and treated that way. But it's basically a road mapping for the interventional radiologist to find where the synovium uh, is, is bleeding. Now, ankle arthroplasty, uh, is increasing. So we see more and more cases and uh, NYU just uh, uh, is building a program to start doing those as well. And here is a, one implant 
uh, which is prototypical. These are usually resurfacing uh, tibia palar arthroplasties. There are different uh, types. Here's one that has like a, like more like a chimney. Here's one that has a double barrel. You can see that uh, um, Mars MRI or metal reduction MRI is very capable of in imaging those uh, with very nice bone implant interfaces here. And so similarly to the other uh, Im uh, uh, implant types, uh, MRI is excellent to evaluate the bone implant interface. So here's a normal bone implant interface with interdigitation into the pore surface. And here's one where there's a, a, a sclerotic rim uh, being, uh, being formed here, both seen on the PDs and the STIR. So this is uh, at least regionally uh, uh, suboptimal osseous integration here. Sometimes we see occult fractures like here. So small crack here, non-displaced with, uh, with uh, surviving bone marrow edema along the tibial component. Okay, so we have evaluated that as well and found it to be helpful clinically, especially in patients where there's a, a, a more than one differential diagnosis clinically and then MRI, of course, can help to narrow this down. Now, what about shoulder orthoplasty? So uh, increasingly successfully done, there's anatomical and then there's reverse. And here is some of the cases where we applied this su successfully as well. So I think this is where advanced metal suppression is really helpful because they are located in the periphery and they're usually cobalt chromium. So there's a lot of metal, uh, uh, metal artifacts. You can see here that there's also an area of um, a failed osseous integration with bone marrow edema here, which is indicating that there's probably micromotion and that this corresponded to the patient's pain here uh, uh, well. Uh, here's a patient with a periprosthetic joint infection of a shoulder orthoplasty and similar to the knee and the hip, this shows like a particular synovitis here with the demodus uh, synovial lining uh, and in this case uh, with bulging of the capsule. So this was a um, patient with um, infectious uh, with uh, a paraprosthetic joint infection here. Here's a case with metallosis. So here's the uh, intraoperative image here of the axillary pouch where you see the metal debris collecting. And if we look carefully, we actually can see this here on the MR image. So here's this black synovium, similar to the hip case that we saw where this uh, synovitic debris uh, with the metal particles is collecting here. So it's not blooming because we're using advanced metal suppression but we can see uh, uh, and potentially identify these cases. Now, what about tumor prosthesis? So this is a little bit more difficult. We said they're usually in odd locations or the arthroplasty implants are larger. So here's a, a, here's a case with a smaller implant, uh, but um, clearly a deformity here. And uh, if you speak to your surgeons, they will say, well, anytime this happens uh, after successful reconstruction, there's tumor recurrence until proven otherwise, right? So this case first underwent CT here, and we can see there is osteolysis around the spruce here, which explains why uh, there was the deformity, but we couldn't find a, a tumor recurrence there. Then we applied a uh, high bandwidth tumor, uh, uh, metal suppression uh, MRI, and the metal artifact is not bad, but of course we would like to have this reduced, right? So we didn't see anything. And then we applied CMEC here, which is challenging in this peripheral location, but here you can see the tumor recurrence of this uh, locally aggressive desmoplastic fibroma. And, uh, with the uh, pre-contrast, post-contrast, and subtraction, you can see here that there's this uh, uh, avidly enhancing, late enhancing fibrous tumor recurrence right where the osteolysis occurred, right? And so you can do dynamic contrast enhancement, as I mentioned before, and since this is a fibrous lesion, it comes late in the venous phase, uh, but these sequences can be tuned for metal artifact reduction as well with high bandwidth and shortening of the TEs. Here's an unfortunate patient with a, a distal femur replacing tumor arthroplasty, secondary to osteosarcoma, with a recurrence here in the popliteal region. And so MRI can be used uh, to diagnose these recurrences, but also to look for the relationship with, with vessels and the articular compartment. And so uh, this was an unfortunate case. They can be done on two stages and can be stitched together to look for uh, skip lesions or additional lesions here. But here you can see uh, the tumor recurrence here in the popliteal region. Okay, what about osteosynthesis? So we usually don't image those with MRI, but there are some indications where MRI is helpful. For example, for uh, femoral neck screws here, especially if we want to make sure uh, that, the, uh, that the femoral head is still intact. So here you can see what difference it makes uh, between high bandwidth and CMAT. So the artifact is by no means bad, but the, but the spatial distortions here are still present and it uh, doesn't allow us to know whether this is actually a flattened femoral head or whether this is intact. Now you could go back to your x-ray and say, okay, I already know it's not flattened and I just wanna see the cartilage and be okay with that. And you may get away with that. 
Uh, but we, if we have it available in the advanced metal suppression, it certainly helps here to show that there is no osteonecrosis and there is no collapse or subsidence. Uh, as opposed to in this case, unfortunately, where there, uh, uh, where there is osteonecrosis here with ischemia and mild flattening, and you can see this, the sclerosis here of the uh, femoral head here. Um, osteomyelitis uh, uh, evaluation works similarly well uh, uh, with metal suppression, so you can tune your sequences to T1-weighted and stir images, and you can see here that at the proximal tibia here, uh, where the osteosynthesis is, that there's an area of osteomyelitis here with a confluence T1 hyperintensity of the marrow uh, with corresponding uh, stir signal hyperintensity and surrounding periosteal reaction. Now, um, I think this was seen on the high bandwidth images, uh, however, it's certainly better seen on the advanced metal suppression here. Uh, this can also be uh, uh, applied for hematoma evaluation. As you know, sometimes uh, uh, neoplasms can hide in hematomas, so we want to make sure that if we have a hematoma, especially in a patient with history of neoplasm, that we're 100% certain that this is just a hematoma and not like a hemorrhagic neoplasm or a neoplasm that started bleeding and it's hidden somewhere. And so this is such a case. Uh, the patient had a uh, 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 intermedullary rod in the femur with a history of neoplasm and had this uh, a new developing mass here at, in the quadriceps musculature, which turned out to be a hematoma, but it was had internal complexity. And with the pre and post contrast subtraction, uh, um, we could show that there was no internal enhancing structure. So this was just a hematoma. So this brings us to the last part of the, le of the lecture, which is amonorography. Okay, so amonorography uh, works best with um, high spatial resolution, high bandwidth images. So this is a protocol uh, that worked for us well in clinical practice that we're still using at Hopkins at NYU. And uh, uh, Dr. Hollywood published that in skeletal radiology. And here are some cases of those uh, uh, of patients that have uh, implants specifically here in the pelvis in the neuro in the lumbosacral plexus. So for example, here patient with uh, hip arthroplasty had a foot drop here and we can see here that um, there's perineal scarring around the enlarged sciatic nerve, which is also abnormally signal hyperintense. So this is a, a good technique to map where the injury occurred and then apply surgical uh, treatment if possible there. Uh, here's a patient that had a pelvic osteosynthesis here um, near the acetabulum, and here's a markedly enlarged obturator nerve here, which is also signal hyperintense that has um, the distal denervation effects already here at uh, adductor group um, obturator externus and gracilis muscles here as well. So uh, nicely fitting. So probably a higher Sunderland injury where there's already denervation effects there. Um, here's a sciatic neuropathy after hamstring repair, right? So this was a, a retired athlete here and they decided to repair the hamstring. And you can see here, there's a small strand of scar that caught the sciatic nerve here. There's some perineal scarring and large sciatic nerve was uh, hyperintense vesicular like pattern centrally, so indicating the neuropathy and showing where the, where the uh, injury occurred. Um, here's a femoral neuropathy after anterior implantation of uh, hip arthroplasty here. And so uh, two nerves are at, at risk here. This is the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, and it's the uh, femoral nerve, of, of course. And so here's the normal femoral nerve on the right side, which is almost not seen, right? But here's the thickened and enlarged the signal hyperintense uh, femoral nerve on this side. Uh, which was, uh, I think in this case, thought to be caught by a hook uh, at some point um, and causing a, a compressive neuropathy here. Okay, so in summary, uh, we have discussed the practical approaches of successful clinical metal artifact reaction, MRI, how we can tackle uh, the most uh, uh, technical pro uh, practical problems. We have discussed effects of different techniques on the visibility of uh, several abnormalities. And then we have reviewed uh, a broad spectrum of clinical applications, which is uh, spanning uh, almost all orthoplasty implants, tumor prosthesis, and monography, and the osteophysis uh, uh, instrumentation as well. Uh, here are some more references that we have published over time in seminars and also uh, radiographics, if you would like to read up on that. Um, uh, there's a lot of people that uh, helped over the time over over time so we have uh, been involved in research for over six or eight years by now so thank you especially we learned a lot from our surgeons uh, about what to look for and what's clinically needed uh, follow me on twitter we publish uh, uh, when we post clinical cases new research developments uh, tips and tricks on a regular basis
Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. That was a really, really awesome talk. Um, really appreciate, again, you coming on and talking with us. And for those of you who are not following him on Twitter, uh, I would strongly encourage you to do so. He's been pumping out really awesome cases, um, and uh, it's a good refresher um, and a good way to see new things that you haven't seen before. So thank you so much for your effort there as well. Um, a couple of questions have come in, um, and I just wanted to sort of tackle these one at a time. And for those of you who have questions, I see people raising their hand. Um, you may have um, missed the very beginning, but uh, most of the interactive features have been disabled. So if you have a question, um, send an email right now to emory, E-M-O-R-Y, M-S-K, radiology at gmail.com. Um, that's where the questions are coming in and I'll be fielding the questions from there. All right, so the first question um, was, uh, regarding short uh, T2 tissue. Um, and so this was, uh, are there any emerging approaches to image short T2 tissues with metal reduction? Uh, yeah, so so one area of research is the ultra short TE. And I think that by itself is very promising, right? Because you decrease uh, the amount of uh, uh, defacing that you allow. And so uh, there, there are promising approaches also uh, for attempts to actually image a specific portions of an implant, like the polyethylene. And so I think it's still work in progress. I haven't seen this really migrating into the clinical applications yet, but I think uh, the, the UTE, CTE um, research is very interesting in that regard. Okay, the next question, um, and this is actually one of my questions. Um, we run into uh, issues with brachial plexus trauma imaging um, and not infrequently, they decide to come back and, and deal with the brachial plexus problem after dealing with the um, traumatic bone injuries. And in particular, we've run into issues with uh, clavicle fractures that get plated and then subsequently we're asked to image the brachial plexus to try to characterize uh, nerve injury in the setting of a clavicular plate. Um, what kind of experience have you had uh, trying to do that? And do you feel like there are any tips or tricks for those of us who are struggling to image the plexus with a plate? Yeah, so so I, I share your struggles there. <laughs> so so I think while the the high bandwidth imaging uh, worked really well in the neuro, in the lumbosacral plexus, it's more challenging uh, in the brachial plexus. So we use the same protocol and try to get away with that. Uh, I have tried many different advanced uh, metal reduction like CMAG. The problem with CMAG is that um, uh, the nerve detail is is less preserved in CMAG than when compared to high bandwidth. Usually the resolution is a little bit lower, so you kind of trade off metal suppression uh, versus nerve detail. So um, I think it it it, it remains challenging, um, but uh, I think uh, the best way to go is to use the high bandwidth protocols and and uh, try our best there. Thanks. Um, next question. Uh, Let's see, is it the same metal suppression technique for all types of implants, titanium, surgical stainless steel, et cetera? Yeah, so uh, the answer is no, right? Uh, the clinical problem is, of course, that we uh, almost never know, right? So sometimes you have a radiograph and you kind of can see whether something is a, is a uh, what kind of uh, component it is, or sometimes maybe there's even a surgical report and you know and you can look it up. But basically, if you have titanium-based implants, uh, with maybe a ceramic head and uh, uh, polyethylene, and then for most implants, uh, less metal suppression is needed. Maybe not even advanced metal suppression is required. Um, whereas if you have a metal on metal with a high degree of cobalt, uh, then they, they may need a, a large amount of uh, metal suppression. The clinical challenge is that we often don't know. So there's good approaches there uh, where people try to use uh, uh, metal suppression scouts, so they try to gauge how much how much signal displacement or how bad is the artifact, and then try to derive uh, how much metal suppression you need. Right. So sometimes uh, we we use a lot of metal suppression because we don't know, but we could scale it down. Right. So uh, Shiv Kaushik, for example, has a has a has a paper out there where they use such a metal scout, right, and they reduce the number of uh, um, spectral bins for the Maverick, for example. So I think that's a good way to go. Uh, I think you could just do it technically. If you see that, uh, you know, this doesn't make a lot of metal artifact, then you can just reduce your CMAC steps, or maybe you don't even need that CMAC uh, and can get away with a high bandwidth imaging. Okay. Um, next question is, uh, how long after um, an implant is placed would you typically wait 
uh, before performing an MRI? Um, I don't. I, I think uh, if there's a clinical indication, we can do that. I think the concern, the, the question may, may be based on concerns for uh, traction or heating. So I think um, I haven't seen any of the implants uh, experience traction forces, right? Uh, so they don't usually contain ferromagnetic components. Uh, unless it's really an antibiotic spacer or something uh, weird, if it's a regular arthroplasty implant, I, I don't think uh, in my practice we wait. Uh, please don't consider that advice. You have to make your own decision there. Uh, but um, yeah, we also know that these implants usually do not experience any substantial heating. Um, so there is little concern from the, from the safety side here. Okay, um, next question is, are all adverse local tissue reactions due to hypersensitivity? And if that's the case, uh, do they uh, occur from the same type of hypersensitivity? Yeah, that's a very good question. So that's kind of a lecture in and of itself. So uh, the, the, the adverse local tissue reaction term is kind of evolving, but I think it has evolved into an umbrella term and it spans the entire spectrum from metallosis to basically hypersensitivity reaction. So it is thought to that it's a, it's a matter of size, right? So uh, different metal products uh, make different reactions. So you can have frank metal debris, which is really small metal particles macroscopically. Then you can have corrosion products, which are really molecules. And then you have to, can have the frank metal ions. And it's thought that the ions make the hypersensitivity reaction and the corrosion products because they're small enough. And those are more in the hypersensitivity range. If you have more like frank small metal particles due to fretting or wear, um, then it's more thought to be on the metallosis, uh, which is really a particles disease, which activates probably not hypersensitivity pathways, but macrophages. So it's really a, a, a spectrum of, of diseases uh, from, I guess, one end metallosis to the other end uh, hypersensitivity reaction. Um, so that's a very good question. So um, it, 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 is, it is evolving still, I think. Great. And the last question that's come in is, um, can the T1 pre and post GAD subtraction technique be used um, when imaging the spine? Uh, and do you have any reference protocols for that? Yes. So um, the answer is yes. So we have applied both uh, high bandwidth and uh, CMAC to the spine, and it worked really well. Interestingly, we have found that uh, in most cases, you get away with high bandwidth. And uh, while CMAC reduces the metal artifact, uh, it actually does it to a lesser degree than for uh, arthroplasty implants, right? But the same techniques can be applied to the spine. I um, see now I regret it that I didn't include it. I thought last night I, maybe I should add the spine as well, but it was already so packed that I had concerns. So I don't get it in 60 minutes. But yes, the, uh, the high bandwidth technique with the subtraction works really well for the spine as well. Fantastic. Um, Jan, thank you again so much for coming on to talk to us today. Um, really appreciate it. And we'll try to put this video out uh, later today. Um, and if uh, people have any other questions, uh, he put out his contact information on the slide in addition to his uh, Twitter handle, so you can reach out to him there. All right, that'll wrap it up. Uh, everyone stay safe, uh, and we look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you so much. Thank you.